Like we're literally having a conversation and you're not recording it. Well, okay. <laughs> Girl. Everyone, <laughs> welcome to Beyond the OC. We're a little delayed for our audience here. Uh, we just had some sound problems. I couldn't hear anything. And, and Not uh, we, you had sound I problems. I did, okay. Well, you guys, we have a really special guest because today is a Beyond the OC interview. We've started this um, series of interviews to get to know people that were part of the OC world a little bit better beyond the show. Uh, today, we're excited to welcome Amanda Rigetti for a Beyond the OC interview. Our talented friend got her start as Kiki's little trouble making sis, Haley Nickel, and went on to shows like The Mentalist, Reunion, Colony. She's also made her mark in films like Friday the 13th and Far From Heaven. Her new movie, Reagan, is in theaters now. She plays Ronald Reagan's mother. Did you say, is it, it's Nell, or did you say Nellie? Did she get called? It's Nellie. It is it's Nellie. Nellie. Good to know because we watched it. I watched it. Um, join us as we dive into her journey, the lessons she's learned, and the stories behind some of her most memorable roles. Please welcome Amanda Rigetti. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <gasps> Wait, so just to clarify, today, it, it comes out today, right? Or like technically like last night at like midnight or something? Yeah, it's like that, you know. The... Where they release it at like 10 p.m. the night before kind of. I think so. Yeah. it's So today's, today is the first full day in theaters. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That's so exciting. Thank you. CG, did you watch it with Gma last night? I didn't watch it with Gma. I watched it by myself. Oh, okay. I watched it um, with um, Adam. And our good friend Xander Berkeley is in it as yes. well. Did you know yes. him before? I did. You know what's really funny? He was Red John in The Mentalist. Oh. He ended up being the serial killer. He was in the pilot and we worked together and then they brought him back like seven years later when they wrapped up the storyline and he was Red John. So He's always in those funny, like he did 24, yeah. those kinds of things. Did you meet, Um, I think his name is Thomas C. Howell? I didn't know because, no, my, all my stuff was like the 1920s. Like oh, it yeah. was sort of, I was in a kind of a small bubble, it felt like, you know, like because all of my scenes were when he was a child. Right. So I had no exposure to any mm, of that. That makes sense. Uh, Thomas C. Howell, he was a dad of my friend in high school. Oh. And every every time I see him on something, because he was on Criminal Minds and played a really keep, creepy serial killer, every time I see him, I'm like, oh, he scares me. CG, you have to watch <laughs> The Mentalist because CG okay. has a I minor watched, in criminology. I watched a couple episodes and I hadn't watched it. My mom's like, okay, Amanda's coming on. Watch this show. I think you'll really like it because I'm like avid criminal minds. Brought like on. I have a psychology degree and a minor in criminology. And it was Silence of the Lambs that made me be like, I want to be Clarice. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I was young when I watched it. And my yeah. mom was like, watch The Mentalist. And I only watched the first couple of episodes. And I was like, where has this been all of my life? That's funny. Like, well, you were young-ish probably when it came out. You were well. You're right. Young. Was it right after the OC? Um, a no. few years later. It was, yeah, a few. years. I would have been late elementary, early teens, like D middle school. Didn't probably. it start like 2007 ish? Uh, 2000. Let's see. Six? 2008. We did the pilot. Okay. I think nine. Oh, yeah, so I was I, in like eight was the pilot. Yeah, I was like second or third grade, way too so, early I mean, for me. Like little, <laughs> probably weren't quite there, with right? The, yet. Oh, no, no, definitely not. Oh my god, I would like be crawling into my mom's bed every night if I was watching <laughs> Colonel Minds in third grade. Yeah, <laughs> and she made me stop sleeping with her at a certain age. She's like, right. no, get out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the family bed, the family bed. Yeah. <sighs> you, how old is your son now? He's 11 and a half. Oh, wow. That's he awesome. started married last week. So yeah. you got pregnant in the middle of The Mentalist. The Mentalist. It was season five, I think. Yeah, yeah. How was that? Like, I've never, yeah. I always How thought. How did that work with your character and everything? <laughs> Sorry, we're jumping right in. Oh, because... yeah. If, if there's spoilers, it's okay. It, right, because it's been on for a while, right? I'm going to watch it anyways. It was really funny because they didn't want to write it into the show. And so we did okay hiding it. I was, he was a January baby. So when I, we broke for the holidays, it was like, it sort of worked out for the maternity leave, but um, we hid it as long as we could. And it just became this sort of running joke on the show. Cause it was like, can we position that water cooler a little lower? Or can you just like stand behind that map? You know, so, yeah. 
it got to a point where I was like, okay, well, clearly my face is getting pretty heavy, but we're not explaining Van Pelt's weight gain. Like oh. we maybe just like put some donuts on the table or something. Uh, but it was like, I, at, at a certain point, I think it was probably seven or eight episodes in to that season. I just started sitting behind the desk because it became too challenging to put stuff in front of yeah. you <laughs> to try to hide it. You know, who's really funny. If you ever watch, um, Julia Louis Dreyfus got pregnant on Seinfeld and they didn't write it in, but in fact, right. I think when I did she's it, she's like, did, she's like always she's holding a, something. She's in just front holding of her. something in front of her. Yeah. Like it's very obvious. Wait. They just didn't even acknowledge yeah. it. <laughs> Wait, what's your son's birthday? January 10th. Oh, oh, I'm the fourth. There you go. Capricorns. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I want to hear about Reagan. I do too. Yeah. I do too. Because I watched it and it was, I loved it. Mm-hmm. I really love how there's the different, like it's kind of broken up into three separate movies yeah. and you can see the, you know, distinctness between them. Um, so how did you get the role? What was the audition process like or were you offered it? So Reagan, I was offered it. Um, from what I understand, I replaced someone Um the the film was plagued by COVID. I noticed that. Uh, was I think it was originally slated to start filming in March of 2020. Which is and, when COVID started. The lockdown, yeah. And and I think before that, from what I understand from the producers, it was like maybe 10 years in the process to get it on its feet. So they didn't even start production in March. And I believe it started in like September or October 2020. And then... They got shut down twice because I think Penelope and Dennis may have gotten COVID. I don't know. Some of the the main cast had gotten COVID. So they shut down, came back, and then there was another outbreak of COVID. So they got shut down again. And then my stuff was filmed like seven months after all of the principal photography with like John Voight and... Dennis Quaid and Penelope Ann Miller, like all that stuff had already been in the can. And because m- my portion of stuff was from the twenties, they brought in like all the model T cars and the set deck and the costume, all that stuff was, you know, it was sort of almost like a separate film. Yeah. Shoot. Um, and it didn't. So we filmed that stuff in Guthrie, Oklahoma. Yeah. And I had like four days to prep. <laughs> what? Oh, Wow. Yeah, it wow. was a pretty quick. It was like a, hey, we need an answer by tomorrow because you got to get on the plane by the end of the week. Um, so it was a really it was a really fast turnaround. And that was the thing that made me most nervous was not having a lot of time to prep. And mm-hmm. I mean, I was born during the, the Reagan era. So my knowledge of Reagan was I mean, I, you know, I knew about his presidency, but not much about his life. So uh, I just started speed reading. <laughs> was the and, like your preparation different since you were playing a real person versus just a character? Yeah, a little bit. I, yes, a lot, actually. I mean, it was, you know, the interesting thing with Nellie is that and there's, I couldn't find any videos on her because she died in the 60s, early 60s. Mm-hmm. So, and at that point, you know, Reagan wasn't, running for president or anything like that. So there was, I don't think there was really any reason for her to be in the public eye. There were photographs of her and most of my research was based off of Reagan's autobiography and various books that were written about his childhood and his upbringing and Mm -hmm. his family life. And then from there sort of pieced together the, you know, filled in the gaps where I couldn't find information and just, um, you know, sort of worked it out that way and, and worked with Justin Chatwin. We did some, we got together the day before we started filming and just sort of started trying to build the relationship between the parents. Yeah, he played Reagan's father. Isn't there Correct. something, like I personally love period pieces and it's been my experience, I don't know if you agree with this, but it, there's something a bit more magical about acting in a period piece because th- between the the costume and the sets and what, what you know, th- they bring in, like you said, the Model Ts and every that you that actually- That sounds so much fun. It really it feels, me, yeah, right? I, I, me, just, I just get I them too. Right? Dude, I, like I, the Universal uh, Studio Tour when you get like plopped right in the middle of like, <laughs> Well, I've gotten to walk around the back set with my mom, and it's just like, yeah, yeah. It, it feels like world. movie magic, and and it feels like you really are a child playing in your fantasy world. 
Completely. Right. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I, I mean, I've always wanted to do a period piece and for this to be a, an offer, but like then a, a period piece to mm -hmm. step back and to play a historical figure's mother that had such impact mm -hmm. and influence in his life. It just, it was a little bit, is this real? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> right. like are, are you sure about this? Are you sure you want to do this with me? Uh, so it, I really enjoyed it so much. And it was, um, yeah. it was just, it was really magical. And, and I think also having the set deck and stuff like that and feeling like you were in that time period and Guthrie, Oklahoma, a lot of the buildings um, that we shot around had been built in the late 1800s. So it oh, wow. really felt like you were mm -hmm. stepping back in a different time. And that I, I just loved it. It was really cool. That's awesome. CG, I have spent so many days and hours on sets in tight dresses and ultra high heels that now every single day I need comfort and comfortable clothes. But, you know, we still want to look good. So I need loungewear that is sleek, flattering, and functional both at home and out and about all day long. I actually have a great idea, Mom. The all-new Roan Women's Recover Collection is the most comfortable, breathable, and super versatile loungewear imaginable. I love all the hoodies, pullovers, vests, and joggers. They're just so soft, and they look and feel great. It's comfortable anywhere. I wear them running errands, teaching yoga, or just hanging out with my friends. I'm actually wearing it right now. Um, I have the joggers on and the sweatshirt, and I love the neutral colors. And this signature heavenly knit fabric blend that has inside-out softness and chafe-free seams, so nothing gets in the way of you and your comfort. I like that it's easy to wear, it's easy to care, because the anti-odor technology means more wears between washes. So you'll be fresh and clean all day long. That's super ideal for you, Mom. I love that for you. <laughs> of course. The Roan Women's Recover Collection champions rest as an integral part of any well-balanced life. Head to roan.com slash OC and use promo code OC to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to R-H-O-N-E dot com slash OC and use code OC. Roan, for every day, for every you, forever forward. Okay, so CG. When I was about your age, I actually figured out that I was allergic to dust, which is pretty much everywhere. And you, sweetheart, inherited that allergy. Thanks, mom. I know. From a very, very young age, I watched you have so many problems with that adorable little nose of yours. Whether you had a cold, a sinus infection, or allergies, you had a pretty hard time with it. And also, like, well, I mean, do you remember that we tried everything I used to squeeze like saline up your nose and oh squeeze gosh, saline something. up my nose. I went to the <laughs> ENT and they tried to suck it out. Like I had such a bad sinus infection that they said if I made one wrong move, my sinuses would rupture. Really? I, I, yes. You don't remember this? Girl. Oh my gosh. I think I blocked it out. Right? I had never ending congestion in high school. It affected my sleep, my focus, my schoolwork, my mood. I was so cranky and my quality of life was just ruined. That's on the past now because I have finally found some relief with Navage Nasal Care. Navage makes breathing easy, easier. My Navage unit has been a game changer for cleaning out this congestion fast. Navage uses smooth saline flow and gentle patented nasal suction to clear nasal passages. I just hold up my Navage nasal cleaner to my nose, press start, and wow, it like totally unlocks and flushes out all that stuff, all that mucus from my nasal passages. And it's fast. It can work as fast as 30 seconds. Navage is drug-free and uses 99.9% .9 pure saline salt pods with no medicinal side effects. There is such a difference since I started using Navage. And as someone who has had chronic sinus issues, I promise you it is worth it. It is so good to be able to sleep without congestion. And I'm not getting the same headaches like I used to. And Adam, my husband... <laughs> He really appreciates that I'm not loudly purring anymore. I mean, some people call it snoring, but I call purring. it purring. I call it yeah. purring. Yes, I call it purring. <laughs> so we want to help you get relief from your congestion too. Our listeners can order a convenient Navage starter pack, including a nose cleaner with batteries included and 30 original salt pods. Everything you need to get started. Plus a cleaning kit as a free gift with your order, but only by going to our exclusive URL, navage.com slash beyond and using our 
promo code BEYOND. Again, to order your Navage free cleaning kit and for full product details, go to navage.com slash beyond. That's promo code BEYOND at navage.com slash beyond. Super refreshing, I think, as an actor, like, and like again, I, I, I speak from my experience, but I find that those of us who have been cast, like somebody said to me recently, the OC, is that that show with all those hot people on it? And I was like, <laughs> I guess. So yes. you get, you yes, get, it get is. so you get categorized and, you know, you were the hot younger sister and, and there's the MILF. You're the hot MILF. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and but, then there's hot DILFs. CG, I don't like that word. She hates when I say DILF. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but 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 as we go along, I feel like I either get up for roles or play a similar role for 20 years, you know, you know, as yeah. you especially and it's like you're still going up for that um, woman. And I'm looking forward to the future in a way that's like, I want to play character. I want to play the person with lines on my face. And, you know, I want to play the mature. And so getting to do what you got to do. If anybody ever says, oh, no, she's known for this or something, you're like, no, 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 I, I can do character. And in fact, I want to do something even more. It's great to use in your future, don't you think? Oh, completely. And, and it's also, it was, it's a lot more in line with, I think, what inspired me to want to become an actor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the pop culture stuff is really fun mm -hmm. and cool, but I think, you know, just the, the period piece stuff or things that you can really dive into a character that has complexities and things like that. I just, I, I appreciated that. And it felt like a total like crossroad moment. In my career mm -hmm. it was like, this is, this is sort of what I have wished and kind of hoped for my whole career is to play a character like this. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm just grateful to be a part of it. And, and your performance was beautiful. It was subtle. It was um, like you said, it, you know, I know, you as actors, you said you worked with the his name is Justin, who played the Jack, the, yeah, his father, his that, father, yeah, that you guys work together. And there's so much work that actors do off screen that that you won't necessarily ever know. But the reason your performance is so lovely and believable, it's because you put all the work into it. You didn't just memorize dialogue, you know. Well, that and that was it. I really, you know, I wanted, I wanted to explore the relationship between Jack and Nellie because even from Reagan's words, you know they were dirt poor, but Nellie really protected the kids from understanding that they were dirt poor. And a lot of it was because of, not because of, but Jack's behavior contributed to the circumstances that they were in economically because he was drinking. But she always painted him in a light that he had a disease and not to judge him or think less of him because of that. We still had to love him. And I think that bond, regardless of how she felt sort of slighted as a, as a woman or, or a wife, she never let that impede on her ability to raise her children and make sure that their parental figures were sort of kept intact and they had their own opinions of, who their parents were. Um, but she was also like, she was someone that really put everyone else first mm. in the community, in her house. Like it was, she was a very selfless woman, um, but she also was a great leader within the church and within the community. So it was kind of finding that balance between strength and vulnerability. Um, and, but she also was very caring. So, you know, it's, but it was a different time too. Right. Like people just doing their best in any given moment. That's yeah. yeah. I mean, it just was a completely different time socially for the way that people made a living, the way that they communicated. I mean, I was thinking about it. The, like, I was in New York this week and we were, I was talking to a friend about these water towers and what was really interesting, it like reminded me that, there was a point in one of the books that I was reading that she would carry buckets of water up to their fourth floor flat while Jack was like watching wrestling and getting drunk in the bar like that, but that she picked up the slack mm -hmm. where he sort of fell short. But I think Reagan got a lot of his storytelling from Jack 
And, you know, he was a very he was very big on telling stories and jokes and things like that. And so I think his wittiness and, and his ability to be a a fantastic storyteller came from his, his dad. And then the sort of softer, like leadership kind of parts were, you know, and his, his faith were a lot more from his mother, but she was also a performer Hmm. and a writer, um, which I, you know, I never knew. I thought it was, it was really interesting. Like she would write pieces for uh, papers and have like essays that would be published in the paper and she would do performances of poetry or Mm -hmm. short plays or speeches. Um, She found her self-expression even. Well, there was, think about it. This was in this, during that time, it was before the talkies. So their form of entertainment was a lot different. Like they weren't going to the movies and if they were, they were silent films. Right. So it was mostly live performance stuff that was entertainment if you were going to go see performances. Right, right. See, I love these these kinds of films because I'm just thinking I was in AP US history and this like when we learned about Reagan's era and everything, this seems like something that should be taught in high school, like how his parents had an impact. And I just I I'm grateful for films like these because it feels like in high school education, you actually miss out on a lot of the really important stuff. Well, and I think that but there's so much they have to kind of cram in. Too. It, it was a lot yeah, of information. Such, oh, my God. Don't, don't get well, me started. For me, <laughs> I learned about Reagan, but I didn't I I didn't know a fraction of what I right. know about him and his life and what drove a lot of the decisions that he made and the kind of man that he was. Um, and a lot of it had to do with the way that he was raised. Can we talk about the scene um, that I, it was pretty brutal that she's, I mean, but we, we get the lesson, but it still would have been difficult as a, as a mother. He's being chased by some boys and she says, they're just going to show up. And is this, was this in the book? That, this was a real event. Yeah. That that she, so ex- she, he comes home, he's being chased by some bullies and, um, Nelly says, you need to face them. And as we see your eyes drop, we're assuming he's on the ground getting beat up. Yeah. Right. Right. Which, yeah, I mean, again, it was such a, a, a tough scene too, because I didn't want her to come across cold. I don't think that was her intention. It was a lesson. It was a learning moment for him. And they moved around a lot. So he was perpetually picked on. Like he was constantly being bullied because they were moving in a, upheaval constantly. And so, you know, at a certain point, it was like the moving's not, we don't know if that's going to stop, but you got to figure out how to stand up for yourself, regardless of the circumstances in our lives. And, and she locks him out of the house to face what yeah. he's running from. Yeah, because you're going to have that your whole life. Your whole life, you have to be able to stand, to stand up. up to it. You're going to just keep running. And, yeah. you know, I think there's a really profound lesson in that. But it was it was true. It was it, I mean, there's a lot of little nuggets in the movie that are like really on point. Yeah, every character except for the John Voight character, which was a which was represented like, a number of different characters, right? Yeah, he was like an amalgamation of like a bunch of characters. Right. Um, so they just funneled it into one. Yeah. But the KG, the KGB did have yeah. a file on Reagan before he was even in, before he even ran for president. It was when he was the SAG the president. president of SAG. Yeah. No, there are fascinating things. I think it's really important, regardless of your political views, to to explore people in their life and that who've made in, huge impacts on the world and 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 his goal for really i mean there we i was a teenager and grew up in the cold war cg we had yeah. literally we'd have these sirens go off and we do um duck and cover but we also yeah. were next to a nuclear power plant and it was okay. we had that all the time <laughs> because of san yeah. onofre but um yeah, yeah and and i i was i was i was in elementary school yeah. but i remember like my parents always watching the news and the threat of yeah. being nuked. I mean, it was just, it was terrifying. There's something that um, recently I've, I've become aware of because we've had shootings and there's all kinds of, you know, people being aware. My husband's a teacher yeah, and um, he's, and I've been going through some of the teaching or 
the training that he's had. And I think there is something that was interesting. They were talking about the fact that people have something called, I think I want to get this right, a normal bias, meaning there's plenty of these teachers who would hear what were actually gunshots, but they assume it's firecrackers or something else that our minds okay. instantly think it's something else. And it reminded me right. of this, that in the eighties, I just never thought that anything that they talked about the cold war and the nu uh, nuclear threat, that it was even real, that it was like, right. that would never, this idea that that could never happen. And yeah. watching the film last night, I saw that. That's so sweet name. Yes, how that 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 they they thought it was a flock of birds that messed with the radar and that we had everything open and then it shows on the radar what areas of the country would have been impacted and that kind of freaked me out because I realized like we just didn't know. We, I, I I agree. Like we just didn't know how close we were. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it's educationally it's I, I think it's a really amazing piece and and that yeah. merit because there there really is a lot of stuff that I mean I didn't know so and I think hmm. you know people of our generation or you know that were born I think I, Dennis says like anybody that was born after like 85 it's you know it's a right. it's an education yeah really it's yeah it was I didn't understand how close the cold war was it's like when I learned it it's like oh it was the cold war because it was like you know, it was cold. It was, that's how they did. That's how my AP US history teacher described it. And it, he was like, yeah, you know, like, like it was like arms distance fighting. Like, the, you know, it wasn't actually like nothing came down on us. And now when I watched the movie, I was like, oh, like I may not have been here. Was it, was it's, it no, true that true. Star Wars, they knew it never worked, but it didn't matter. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, right. just, I mean, there is so much to be said for um, intelligence and spy and all that is, is that's I'm what's formed. Me. Yeah, it's formed our, our history and our, and our countries. Two things. Oh, so when the, when the wall was coming down, that was a big deal. I was, um, you know, I, he said, tear that down that wall in 87 and it came down in 91. I want to say 91, I think. I think so, yeah. And so CG, your grandfather has a piece of the Berlin Wall that, you know, because people started taking it and selling it and he bought it like at auction or something. And t I, I, I was like, that's, and it, they show a picture of the wall and then he has the piece and I'm like, that's not the same thing that somebody made that, <laughs> but, but I don't know. If it's Wait, real enough. I swear so you to God. think the one my grandpa has is fake? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I always said, house? I was like, this house yeah. or my other grandpa? I no, it's in it's in Indiana. Oh, my other grandpa. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But no, but m your grandfather, my dad, worked with Ronald Reagan on Death Valley Days, an episode of Death Valley Days. I thought funny. that was kind of a cute, like, yeah. just, you know. Because, yeah, he was, that. like, That's funny. he was like, I worked with that guy. My dad was a Democrat, so. <laughs> but, oh, man. Um, well, listen, um, congrats. Everybody go see it. Um, it's fun to see um, people we know and, you know, Dander Berkeley, who I got to work with on Nikita, who's a dear friend. Yeah. I don't know when this episode's airing, but. It's next week. We're, it's landing next okay, week. Okay, so it'll have been out for a week when you guys listen to this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> go watch it. Yeah. <laughs> With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. With the changing menu of 50 recipes to choose from each week, HelloFresh makes it easy to always find something the whole family will love. HelloFresh meals can easily be customized to fit your taste. With protein and veggie swap options, you and the whole family can choose just the right combos for each week's deliveries. I love to cook, but me and my grandma, we have totally different tastes. I go for the veggies and the plant-based meals, and she loves the meat and veggies plan. I liked the shawarma spice chick people, and my grandma loves the onion crunch chicken, and she ate it all. Oh, good. Yeah. It's been pretty busy in our house, and I'm glad that I don't have to think about what I'm cooking every night. So we've been doing the pescatarian plan, and I love the Louisiana-style tilapia and the lemony Brussels sprouts, and one of my all-time favorites, barramundi with cilantro sauce. I like saying barramundi. I haven't had the barramundi yet, but <laughs> I'm excited to try it. And for a limited time, kids eat free. Go to HelloFresh.com slash beyondkids to unlock this exclusive offer. One free kids meal per box for two months while subscription is active. That's 
free kids meals just by going to hellofresh.com slash beyond kids. America's number one meal kit. You know, let's get into a little bit of a, I have a few questions about your journey because this life beyond the OC thing, um, like what was life for you like for you right after the OC? He, it was really exciting, actually. The OC opened a lot of doors, but it sort of coincided with, I had a holding deal with Fox. Right. Which led to the audition for the OC. And then that led to North Shore, mm -hmm. which became part of the holding deal because North Shore was a Fox for Fox. And OC was like, I think it was Warner Brothers for Fox. Um, so it really kickstarted my career. Uh in a way that I, I don't think I fully registered until a few years later, you know, um, I was just sort of like a young actor, like trying to hustle, trying to find it. It's know. all this energy coming at you, right? Like we yeah. want you there. We're going to, you're going to be, I know you're a guest star and then they turned you into a regular and was it not good to work in Hawaii? Does it sounds amazing? Yeah, is it? It's fantastic. I yeah. think the thing of it was I, we couldn't figure out how to thread the needle to get me back to California to film because the schedules were so crazy, like for North Shore. And then the flight is six hours and the time change. And because I was a regular on North Shore, they were like, we're first position, you know? Yeah. And because it was holding deal, uh, it was a holding deal gig. It, I sort of, was I was obligated to give them that first position, um, which, you know, I always am like, I'm curious what Josh and Stephanie had in mind, had I been able to stay for season two, because I really wanted to be like, I was so excited to be a part of the OC and I really wanted to come back for the second season, but scheduling wise, we just could not make it work. Um, I think I, I came back to do that wrap up episode with, um, with Tate. Tate on the boat where we call where he looked really hot. <laughs> we're, we're, CG, Rachel and I are both like, he looks so hot. And, and CG goes, no, he didn't. He looks gross. <laughs> he looks so like he needs a shower. I know, but he's, he's like, been living on a boat, like just drinking, go take a shower, Tate. But that's one of our favorite scenes because he's, she's on the phone with this amazing opportunity to go to Japan. And there's, and there's Jimmy going, Arr, let's go, let's go. <laughs> he, he did the R cap. <laughs> the pirate sound, let's go to Cabo and drink some wine, you know, and, yeah. uh, but you know what, I, I was going to save this conversation maybe to the end, but we're, we're here now. So let's, um, because I think that's a really interesting thing because I thought about this as we were talking because, or preparing for this, what would the writers have done with Jimmy and Haley? Because I think it would have been fantastic to, to, um, kind of be a thorn in the side for Julie. You and I would have had fantastic things. Oh, yeah. And Kiki as well, because of her her past relationship with Jimmy. Her relationship with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, can you imagine? I know. I know. When I think, I mean, when people ask me, well, what would have happened? It's like, oh gosh, I, I really, I'm so curious to, to pick Josh's brain to know yeah. if they had a plan or if there was like an idea of what they wanted to do with it. And then, of course- my scheduling sort of threw a monkey wrench in the whole thing. Right. But I, I'm so curious to know what they would have done because I agree. I think it would have, it would have created so much drama or lended itself to the opportunity for, for drama within the show. Haley was one of those characters that could like really stir it up. And I remember when I watched it for the first time, I did ask myself, I was like, wait, she was funny. Like <laughs> my, my two favorite Haley moments. The first one is when you two go and dive into a pool of fighting. Yeah. And I'm like, that's as a kid, like I'm 18. I'm like, that is so funny. Haley should be there. Like she's, she's the stir, like, like the drama starter. And I feel like there could have been so much done with Haley. You know, the other thing is that, that I, I, I feel like that was much more the adult storyline mm. and it would have taken away from the, the intention which was like more the, the kids. kids yeah it was more the show was really driven by the kids right. yeah. and the drama and the coming of age and all that kind of stuff so you know everything happens for a reason and yeah. i you know it, it it sorted itself out i think i think it wrapped it up in a really nice way uh but i i'm always yeah. curious i think there would have been there would have been 
great scenes with Caleb as well, where Caleb treats oh, yeah. Haley completely different than he does yes. Kirsten. Kirsten, for some yeah. reason, like Haley is his baby, and yeah, where and you and then you could actually see why 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 Kirsten became an alcoholic. There you go. Right. There were <laughs> there were little nuggets for that the entire show. Right. I, we were we were talking about this on a different episode. I'm like, were they planning it? from season one for Kirsten to become an alcoholic because you can pick up yeah, there's the lots tiny of little eggs. things that make things. her the way she is. I don't know yeah. if it was, but they definitely wanted to show. I think there was. I, there may have been, a, in the Bible, there may have been some some stuff. because in the OC Bible. Yeah, yeah the Bi- OC Bible. That's what they call it, you know. Well, yeah. I want to say my my other favorite Haley part, um, which we just, I feel like we watched this episode. We, uh, we did a podcast about it, mom or something, but it's when you're on the boat with Jimmy and you tell him about Tokyo and I'm like 24 trying to find a job and all this stuff. And I was just like, that is the biggest girl boss moment. Like (laughs) I, I don't need a man. I'm going to Tokyo to pursue a career. Like, bye. That's more important. And I was like, there you go. That's what women need to hear nowadays. Yeah. And I yeah. I was like, yes, Haley, character development. Yes. Yes. My favorite <laughs> line of dialogue that one of my favorites from the entire series, because they had this idea, my, the hairdresser came to me and said, uh, well, first of all, it's I walk in from Paris with a bright red bob and Haley goes, Julie, your hair. And I say, Haley, you're here. And I just thought it was yes, so clever. Yes. It was just a really quick way to acknowledge that because the hairdresser came to me, Daniel Curette, and he yeah. was like, let's do this fabulous Renee. Um, oh, gosh, what's her name? The one from um, Tin Cup. Uh, anyway, but it's like a, a bob. And they put all this extensions and they made it bright, bright, bright red to our, um, our DP was like, uh. <laughs> he was like, that's red. And he had to like adjust lights for it because it was too red. Um but yes, no, I just like, that was how, how we entered. I mean, the very first thing I wrote this one down for very first time we see you is when you're in the pool house and Ryan's like, or you say, who the hell are you to Ryan? He's like, it's a long story. Who, who the hell are you? It doesn't work that way, dude. It's my pool house. Actually, dude, it's my pool house. Oh, so this is yours. You want it back? And you're wearing his, are you wearing his chain? Sure, yes. The, the wife tank. beater. We're not supposed to call it that anymore. His goes, classic white tank top. He goes, I've like got plenty. Wear. Thanks. Great way to introduce you because we don't know who you are, right? Yeah. 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 My mom said something to me. I just, this is like, so you were younger than Ben, but playing older than him, right? 1920. 19. I was 19 playing 27. Yeah. 27. We, okay. We, we were we were trying to do the math because for I, I'm like, I need to figure this out. We her and I talked about Did, this. You're gonna like, drive yourself uh, nuts. Like yeah. this half hour. <laughs> playing the kids. Like Tate would, being like, you're right. oh, you're Kirsten's 25-year-old sister. But then if we do the math and like you're 25 and Kirsten's having Seth, and then don't do Kate it. Kate said like they were babysitting. I'm like, how old is Haley? Don't do I it. I don't know. I Haley talked, I talked to her like, like yeah. yeah. I was, was like, like 27, yeah. 28. There you that's go. what I said. But then there's people online being like, she's 24. I'm like, that's, yeah. do the math. She was closer in I, age to Misha than anybody. I Yeah, that's right. In real I think life. I, yeah. In real life. Yes. In real life. Wow. Well, okay. Let me ask you, let's go deep, man. <laughs> <laughs> we did we i started a series uh well i was like you know we're, we're doing this countdown for the for the, the the fans have voted on but then um i thought let's do these beyond the show interviews like, and we started with autumn and she's just this incredibly wonderfully spiritual person and and they're just like really great great conversations so yeah let's let's go deep what's your biggest secret <laughs> no. <laughs> no we don't do that Oh, over in our chat, Josephine is here, one of our um, supporters, Patreons. Hold on. And she said, when Haley left, it was the beginning of the end for Jimmy. Lol. Butterfly effect on the rest of the characters, too. And then she said, you're the true pot stirrer, CG. Yeah. (laughs) I am the pot stirrer. Thanks, Josephine. No, I just want... That's what I'm here for. (laughs) No, I've got a few questions. Like... I just think it's a really interesting thing because we, we're we're talking about a show that was over over twenty years now ago, yeah. uh, and 
And I think what's really fascinating, and it's something that that I've done over the past you know number of years, and really reflect back. And I'm so excited for the future, but I think there's something interesting about who I was then to who I am now and the lessons we've learned and the challenges and and all of that stuff. And one of the biggest things is like the industry has changed so much. So much. From when we started. And what do you think about the future of all of this? I mean, it's it's such a different thing. It's a little nerve wracking at times. It really can be, right? I, I don't know. It feel I feel like I'm in a bubble sometimes, especially dealing with the audition process. And the self-tapes at home. And and you don't know if you should be making adjustments on anything because it's not your, like, and there's time, like there's been times where I've had to record the other characters' lines because I can't get a reader, right? And so I'm like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Like it feels a little bit isolated. I, I mean, CG has to FaceTime me sometimes. Hey, I'll do, I'll be your reader. Just I'll FaceTime you. I, like, that's what we I, have to do sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's crazy. it turns into that. It's, it's taken hours. Like you, you get the sun right. You get the lighting right. Like CG's you like, it's been talking. Like, <laughs> I know. Well, it's, and like, that's it's a, so much more of a process than you would well, just go in. Longer, it's like, Hey, I'm an actor and I'm going in to like present a character to you. Like yeah. with the self tape, you have a lot more responsibility. It's not just the acting part. You have right. to make sure the background is clean or, you know, whatever they're suggesting it be. And you have to be the lighting person and the director and the editor. And, you know, so in some ways I think it, it gives you perspective on other aspects of the industry, but I find it to be challenging at times because I feel like I'm an Island. Like I just, I'm like, I don't know if this is landing. I don't, I don't even know if it's getting seen. Cause we're used to this collaboration. Right. That's and even, even the medium of auditioning has a cat at the very least you have a casting director who's there yeah. champ- yeah. champing you. We just something. spoke with Patrick Rush last week and he was saying like, he used to see, Oh, maybe a hundred people for a role. Now he watches thousands. He said it was 700. Well, yeah. yeah. The thing is, they're so inundated with these tapes that how do you stand out? How do you, and that, and that's the difference now is they are inundated with a lot more actors to view than they mm-hmm. were before, because there's only so many hours in a day and there's a deadline. And so it, you can only schedule so many actors in an afternoon, right. but with tapes, you get a lot more, so much, yeah. a lot more options. Right. And so I, I it's, it's, a, it's just, very different in ways that I feel like I'm still learning how to grasp and figure out. I think you just hit the nail on the head because when we first started doing this a few years back, there was anger, stress, and the, you know, my husband might help me and he was like, God, this is not a fun experience. And I was like, I really need to figure out a way to make this fun and in the moment yeah. because mm-hmm. It wasn't always fun helping you either. <laughs> no. And- but but I com- I completely understand. I don't like watching myself perform. I am hyper hypercritical. And it so doing self tapes is like death for me. It's so hard for me to narrow down which one to yes. send. And then it's like, oh, that performance felt really good. And I go back and look at it and I'm like, what am I doing with my face? Or why am I looking that way? Or, you know, it's like, then I start to get really hypercritical about the performance or the sort of vanity of it, right? Like the way it looks and it feels a little off point, right? Like it's not really what we're doing. It opens the door for you to just pick apart every little thing instead of you just go in you read your script, the casting director might give you one or two things to do. And I think it takes just speaking from after we talked with Patrick and knowing from my mom, I feel like it takes some of the personalization out of it too, because you want to know what a person's demeanor is like, what they're like when they come in, if they're kind, if they're standoffish, like you want to know who you're going to be working with. And with the self tape, you have no idea. You have no idea. And they can be awful. You can cheat a lot more. I mean, I'm just being honest. You know what I mean? Like you can, I I feel like you can, you can tape it a hundred times before you find one that you feel comfortable with. And that's not how it works in the room. 
you get one or two chances and it's like, okay, can you take adjustment? But I also think the energy of walking into a room, not having that, that affects me. That's, I have to create that now with self tapes because I I always, I mean, most of my career has been booked from audition. Yeah. Right. And it's the, it's the good nerves that get that, like get you going and do your best. I just auditioned uh, to be an instructor at a yoga studio. And I was like, freaking out. You had to memorize all these things. And the second I did it and it, it's like all the judges are there. It's like, but you need that energy. I feel like to give your best performance mm-hmm. yeah. a lot of the time. I think so. I mean, for me, I work, I work well under pressure. Exactly. Yeah. Kind of energy and those kind of circumstances help me. I use what I get yeah. And then, and I also use the reader and what the reader's giving me. Like, so it, it affects my performance. Whereas mm-hmm. like if I'm reading with somebody that I'm familiar with, I feel like I lose things sometimes. You know, and I think that's what, so you, you, you send them a tape and they say, okay, now we're going to do a live callback with the, you know, cause we used to just go straight to producers and every okay. once in a while that happens, but that now it's, you have to wait to get that. And I've actually had some interesting live zoom uh, and you and they test studio test on live Zoom now, which is wild. So it doesn't make sense. Yeah. But 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 you, but what, it's like but here's look? <laughs> I can't answer this for myself. Where do you look? Which like which person do you look at? Oh, okay. So yeah. So what they do is they all leave, and then the act. Well, if you're lucky to have the actor or the reader, you just get rid of everyone except that reader. So you okay. so you look right out that reader. Okay. What is what is it called when they when they test two people like a compatibility test? A chemistry. 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 Read. Patrick Rush was saying people, he's been there while they do it on Zoom. They chemistry read. And I'm like, that just doesn't make sense to me. It is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah, it's it's different. It's just, it's it's a totally different way than than how I started. Yeah. You know, and and obviously what you're used to as well, Melinda. It's like, you know, it's just, it's a completely, and the industry has always gone through ebbs and flows, right? Like this is just the new norm. Pivot. It's all about pivot. If you went, yeah, we went from silent films to talkies and thousands and thousands of people did not make that pivot and left the industry. And now um, the idea that, you know, even if you've made a name for yourself and you're still, you're sending these auditions out, we used to get feedback and you hear nothing. And it's like the no, the no feedback is the feedback. Right. But one of the things that I came off of, like, I was just thinking about this, the coming off of the OC, I came off going, because... I have a daughter in private school and I have bills to pay. I wasn't like, oh, I'm so excited. I was like, I need a job. And of I course. didn't realize till later that I'd become a, well, I didn't, I was a perfectionist, but I was, I, I was even more of a perfectionist. And one of the things that I have have worked on recently, at some point in our lives, I think everybody gets to a point where they're like, I need to do some real stuff deep self-work and really look and that's what the pandemic kind of did for me because everything slowed down and I was like I'm gonna process some stuff right it did for me too yeah absolutely like when the world turned off and Hollywood shut down you have no choice like yeah. nothing everything came to a grinding halt so it's just you and the four walls that you're sitting in right and you know so it really it was like in for me it was really in my face I was like okay well now I have no excuse because I have all the time in the world right and, and it's an interesting thing because we have no distraction of when's the phone going to ring? Is this audition going to be there? All of a sudden it was like, I just have to do what's in front of me. And oh, wow. I realized that I had become a very, um, I didn't realize all the voices in my head, the voice that the lies I told myself, the negativity, all the things that had been, that I gathered in my first 50 years. Yeah. I was like, there's a lot of stuff that's not working for me. And I'm going to get rid of it. And so there was a big cleansing and figuring out like, I do have control over how my thought process and how I get through the day and, you know, a self tape. And it's been a remarkable thing to actually start looking at, oh, I used to be this way. And instead of being fearful of the future, I'm just excited for the unknown. It's a reframe. It's a reframe. You just got to kind of reframe how you look at it. But it takes time and practice and awareness to go, oh, I'm having a negative reaction. I do that way too much. Mm-hmm. And and then one of the things that's been a big deal because of just the way I was brought up in this industry, Hollywood is everything. 
you drop it. everything is like that's all it is my purpose in life is to be an actor and it's like no my purpose in life is to be a useful human being and a yeah. good mother and a good friend and good wife and that's the talks. purpose I know. but i think that's what's interesting because now it's like of course i love acting and i'm back in an acting class because i'm doing it because i love it and everything but i have no idea what the future holds right. you know yeah and i have to be okay with that even if you never get hired again i know Whereas my young self would have been like, oh, God, you know. Well, yeah, the panic, panic ensues. And then you're just dealing with the anxiety and the panic all day about how your thoughts are running away with themselves. Right. Well, I have a question after what my mom was saying. After you had your son, what was it like working afterwards with a young child? Because I know I was three when I was on the show with my mom. And just what was your experience and how did motherhood change? Maybe just, you know, your routine with work and how you manage everything. I think I feel like I'm still trying to learn how to manage it, you know, because it ebbs and flows and it changes. And I, I think the biggest challenge I had was the pregnant brain mm -hmm. and trying to keep words in my head. And because I had a lot of exposition on the mentalist. Oh, wow. Yeah. If they changed anything on me the day of, I had such a difficult time. I could not make it stick unless I had it for at least 24 hours. I had to run it, run it, run it, run it, run it, sleep on it, run it, run it, run it, run it. But it just, I don't know what it was. I, I, pregnant brain, I guess, but it, I just had such an overwhelm too. You know, I think when you're a new mom, there's so many new things that are happening and your life is completely changed for all the best ways, but it's an adjustment. And um, to dive right back in without feeling like I had fully adjusted, I was, I, I felt like I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants and figuring it out as I was going. And I feel like I, I wish I would have given myself a little bit more grace and not beat myself up so bad because mm -hmm. it probably would have made things a little easier. I had that experience when CG was 10 and I went to Toronto to do Nikita. Mm -hmm. It was very overwhelming. I was going through a divorce, but at the same time, I was just was so, there was so much going on that I couldn't memorize my dialogue. I couldn't remember it the same way I could before. So I had to yeah. change. And it was like you said, it I had to do so many extra days yeah. of memorization. And it took me, it was like four days solid of all this exposition yeah. that I would need to do to make sure that I would, could do my job. And I expect on both on the mentalist and Nikita, you both are saying some wacky, like <laughs> really specific, like jargon that you would yeah. never say in your real life. Mom, you had to speak Russian. And like, <laughs> I, I can only imagine like when there's so much else going on in your brain and you have to like memorize these extremely detailed, like I applaud you both. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You get through it yeah. though, but our voices in our head are sometimes our worst critics. And like you said, be kind. It's okay. Making mistakes yeah. are a lesson, right? Well, and I think that was, that's one thing I've been learning how to practice in this like post pandemic. Yeah. I real with myself. The, the chatter and the um, beating myself up for a bar that I set for myself that I can't achieve. It's like, this is all something I have completely created in yeah, my head. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> just, just stop. <laughs> well, and our best on any given day can be different. It's just doing your best is different every single day. Completely. We discussed this a lot with Autumn. I'm an avid reader and I feel I'm on this personal, what you guys are talking about now. I'm She's just doing, doing it early. Bit, doing it a little bit early. Good. Yeah, yeah, right. That's what my mom says. I'm like, this sucks. But she's like, it's good. You're doing it now. <laughs> Are there any like books or philosophies or speakers who have really impacted you that you like to, you know, look back to or maybe people in your life who impact you? You know, it ebbs and flows. I right now, the kick I've been on is Dr. Joe Dispenza. I'm just fascinated by some of the research and stuff that he puts out. Like I'm I, I'm fascinated by it. So I've been sort of digging into his, some of his stuff, uh, some of his meditations and books mm. uh, as of late. But I'm a believer. And I that for me, I, I always kind of go back to that as a grounding and and just trying to listen to that still small voice to find direction in times when I'm feeling really challenged or confused or 
not really sure which direction to turn. And it, yeah, it's, I, I mean, there's a book I'm about to start reading called Flow that's on my desk and it's about just trying to get into the flow of energy and, you know, what's, what you, what you set your mind to as well. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if you, if you're feeding yourself negativity constantly, that's what you're going to produce. Mm -hmm. And if you're feeding yourself positive thoughts and framing things as, you know, uh, something for the future that, you know, embracing the unknown, as you were saying, Melinda, like there's, I think there's something to be said for how our, our body reacts to that. I mean, the, the body keeps score. Mm -hmm. I really believe that, you know, and I, I feel like if we're beating ourselves up constantly, it starts to manifest. And if we're feeling all that kind of negative energy and stress, it manifests somewhere in our body. And, and then, you're dealing with things that it's like, wait, why is this happening? Or why can't I really feel like I'm back on track? And, you know, I, I think it's important to control our thoughts. Do you have any daily practices or rituals or, or exercise? You box, don't you? What do you? I box. Yeah. That's, oh wait, that's box. so cool. I want to start <laughs> kickboxing so bad. I love that. Yeah, I've, um, I started actually, um, like MMA, MMA style boxing when I was in my twenties, and what? that's awesome. Uh, and then, and then I kind of got more into the traditional kind of. My dad was into it when he was younger, uh, but I started doing it more after I had my son because I just was having trouble getting the weight off, and it was fun, and it didn't, you know, it was like an opportunity to like just get like, to punch some stuff. Punch some stuff. <laughs> just it's get it so out. Bad. Punch some so, stuff. See, so, so you, you know? got that uh, in you, I think. I, I have yeah. boxing gloves in my room. <laughs> so, yeah, I I mean, I, I do that. And um, depending on how busy my schedule is, I'm I'm usually there three to five days a week, depending. Um, oh, wow. But I also, you know, I meditate um, and I, I'm trying to really implement a practice of meditation and build it. Um, you know, I've sort of started small with like, it's not easy, right? Meditation is really hard. It's hard, you know, but it's, it's a lesson. If it's hard, then that means you probably it, should be doing it. That means you're it, doing right? it right because you're practicing <laughs> yeah. it. And I think something I've learned recently is meditation doesn't always just have to be sitting there with your eyes closed and thinking about things like medicate meditation can be a practice. Like to me, when I do yoga, that is meditation. My brain goes Shh. like, I don't think about anything except the way my body feels. And to me, that's meditation. And if people can find some kind of outlet like that, or if it is sitting there with your eyes closed and letting the thoughts come up and just letting them wash away, like it is so important to have an outlet where you can just let your brain and your thoughts just relax. Well, and I get, I like, I find myself overwhelmed a lot. Uh, so for me, it helps me to just turn off what's happening outside and reconnect to my breath. Mm. And then I'm like, okay, I can re-enter whatever it is that I'm doing and, right. and, and, and be more present. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's mostly what I'm striving for. I want to be able to be more present in my day to day and not be stuck in my head about whatever's going on in my head. Time traveling. That's what Jim, Jim Carrey says. I don't time travel. I don't think about the past. I'm not in the future. Eckhart Tolle, power of now. Cause it really, it's really true. It's like when you keep thinking about getting to some place, by the time it gets here, it's here. So that's all that, of course we make plans. And, and if you're thinking about the future or you're thinking about the past, you're not living in mm -hmm. what's here right now. You can't do them at the same time. If you're worrying about things happening, you may think you're actually preparing yourself for it. But what happens when something like that inevitably happens is you seek out confirmation bias to make these things happen because you're thinking about it all the time. Yeah, and it's true. just, it's this endless cycle of worrying and confirmation bias and freaking out. Well, and 90% of the stuff that you're freaked out about doesn't even end up happening. Right. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like you turn yourself into a tizzy over something that's just a creation in your head. I think that happened to me 
it magnified when CG was born because as yeah. a parent, you start thinking, what if this, 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 or this, all these things happen. And our minds are so powerful that our bodies don't know it's happening. Like we literally yeah. can think about something in our mind and our bodies get, get produces adrenaline or cortisol. Yeah. And that's the, the true definition of stress. We're stressing about things that aren't happening. Yes, they could happen, but wait until they actually happen to have the reaction because- you're, then you're in this constant um, high adrenaline cortisol and this terrible cycle of, of future stress. tripping is not good. That's what no. my therapist calls it. Future tripping. <laughs> no. I like that. Future, future tripping. tripping. So what inspires you on a daily basis? Do you have to look for it or or do you, are you in a practice of, because that's the thing, like I, I had to start practicing waking up and doing like a gratitude list and, and to for it to be just a natural Thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, look, it, I think it depends on the day yeah. and just where I'm at. Um, I, I, I bought a place a couple of years ago that's kind of tucked in the shadow of the mountain. And I've had, I have a lot of trees mm -hmm. and nature around me. And that I, I, that's been food for my soul. Like I, you know, I'll just go outside and just sit quiet for a minute and look around me and, and being able to appreciate the stillness of those moments. Um, I think it helps, it helps kind of reground me and find inspiration just in things around me instead of like, not inspired, what am I looking for? You know, um, I, 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 because I am a recovering perfectionist. Yes. It's hard. Yes. It's hard because you, you get us. Yeah, you, you get you get up, especially if you can, especially the dialogue thing. <laughs> if you're perfect, people come up to you like, that was amazing. Thank you. And you think you're like, like I've been losing my mind for days, but thank <laughs> you. That's yeah. what I wanted to hear. Right, right. <laughs> Do you well, um, I would just I want to if we're going to close it out, I want make sure I want to ask this. Um, Do you have any advice for your younger self, you know? early 20s. What would you just, tell your younger what self? What would you tell your younger self given I would everything tell, you've been through? Yeah, I would tell my younger self to trust my instincts a little more um, and not second guess it and and not look to the outside world for validation, mm -hmm. but to, yeah. to just trust what is within. I think it's really, I, I will continue to say this, be very conscious of the voice and the lies that you tell yourself because and like they Sanji manifest said, into reality you can yeah that becomes your reality what's going on well, yes, but just just like you can manifest yeah. something great exactly it works both ways yeah i i believe that i think it works both ways and it's you know it's what you're feeding it's, yeah. it's what you feed yourself so what are you looking forward to in the future um career wise personal wise I think we kind of touched on it, but I just you know I'm actually I'm I'm looking forward to being able to approach the next chapter with this new sense of myself, mm -hmm. you know, and and a, a new sense of like connecting to who I am and and um, kind of I don't know doing it my way a little bit yeah. more on in the next chapter, you know. I, I feel like I. I kind of went wherever I felt I was supposed to. Right. Or and, and and that happens when you're in your 20s. Yeah. yeah. Right. They're they're telling you you should do that. I can't tell you how many agents, managers. No, I, I got lost in that a little bit. Like yeah. I really I felt like I was having a bit of an identity crisis in my mm -hmm. late 20s and early 30s and I just felt like I I'm I'm slightly off step. So the 20s 20s are hard for everyone. I think they are. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> Get me out of here. <laughs> I, like I was like, I though. You know, I was like, God, I don't want to go back to my teenage years. Uh, in the 20s, I, in my 20s, I, I felt like I had, um, I had success. So that sort of like, get me out of this didn't really happen, I think, as severely as it can for others in their 20s, but I, I felt like it came later for me. Like it came as I was in my later 20s and my early 30s where it was like, what am I, what am I doing? Mm. And, you know, and so I had to, you know, I've been doing the work and yeah, 
you know, the, the pandemic was, was a blessing in disguise in some ways yeah. uh, for that. And so I look forward to what the future holds and how all the work I've been doing can be put into practice. It's like, wow, I actually, I mean, at some point, and I hate to say that and I'm never ungrateful, but I think there are times when, when we're younger, where we're working these 18 hour days and it's, and it's, and we're exhausted and we, we just want time off and we take the time off. And then so I used to say, we complain when we work, we complain when we don't work. And now it's like, I don't complain when I'm not working and I don't complain when I am working. Being able to sort of embrace where you are in any given moment. Or worrying about what people think. That's yeah. a been a that's a really big one as an actor. That's like I think so huge. as well. Absolutely. Every because, human being and actors specifically. It's really hard. Well it's it's a it's a visual medium. Yeah. It's an emotional medium, you know? And so I, I it, they are sort of intertwined with each other that way. Mm -hmm. And you know, because it's requires an audience to to care about whatever it is that you're doing in order for them to show up right so there it's it's hard to get away from what do people think yeah. um you know but but i think as an artist you know finding that place of contentment with your own work and what you're what you're putting out you know and without any pretenses about what people think or how they're perceiving it, but how it sort of can, can feed your creative impulses. Right. Um, you know, and that's not to say that, that you're an Island and you want to work alone. It's, it's, no. it's also being open to people. The collaboration is still being open, but also it's just, there's one of the things you realize, and I think it's tr become becoming a little bit more kinder and gentler, but I grew, I started working, so did you, in the world where you're, it's ego driven, it's toxic, there's negativity, it's subjective. And that stuff, like I said, came out, I came off of the OC kind of just filled with all of that. Well, and it leaves impressions on you that yeah. are, I think, kind of hard to shake at times. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But, but the great thing is, I mean, I literally had this idea. I was like, I'm never going to work. Once the show is done, I'll never work again because I'll be too. Which is not true, but well, you know. I know it's crazy though that the the nonsense that you yeah that but you feed yourself. And Thirty eight is so old. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like what? Oh I know. God. So I want to end with this. Um, did you did you read the book, the uh, oral history? What did you think? No, but I've signed a lot of books. You went? I have no, I haven't read it. Yet. You haven't I, read it. I, I, I skimmed through it. I didn't like. I haven't sat down and read it cover to cover. Oh, okay. but I have read like certain pieces of it. Okay. But yeah, I've I've signed quite a few of them. Oh, you have! <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah, no. Tate Tate said the same thing. Tate was like, I just skimmed through it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I kind of skimmed through some of it. I haven't. I've I not for lack of want. Yeah. It's more just time, but it's um, long. I I found it fascinating because yeah. it was the piece that I personally, when the show ended, the piece that was behind the scenes, the executives, the networks, how the industry works, how a show that burns so bright. And then as jo Josh and Stephanie thought it was such a failure at the end. And I had no idea. And everyone's experience was so different. different. So it's, it's, it's really revelatory. E not even if you're not interested in, in just the show itself, but it just talks about a lot about what was going on behind the scenes. And I just found that fascinating. Of course I was involved, but I still think right. it's interesting even if you're not involved. So, Well, there's so much that happens behind the scenes that people don't know about, you know, and even actors, like they, I yep. feel like they keep, they try to keep the actors out of it. Totally. I mean, it's funny because I'll get questions about certain shows that I've done in the past and I'm like, ah, I don't, I mean, that's like a total writer, showrunner question i have no idea who how that storyline would have ended up or why the show didn't go yeah as long you know there's so many politics that happen behind yeah. the scenes and you know sometimes it used to be like you'll get uh executives at the network that really champion a show and then their contract is up and they leave mm. and then the new people that come in just want to start with a clean slate and it has nothing to do with the show or the people involved in it it's just it's the shakeup at the network. Yeah. You know? can't take it personally. It's so out of our control yeah. in that way. It's the four agreements, kids. That's what we're doing. <laughs> right. That's the book recommendation of today's podcast. Go buy the four agreements and read it. 
Well, I think we covered it all. Thank you so much, Amanda. And seriously, I don't, I'm going to send you my cell. If you ever need somebody to read with you, because I Thanks. think it's really important. Like, it's fun to, I think, here's the thing, asking our family members to do it, but actors love to do it. I know. And I'm like, yeah. I need to, like, I'll be calling you, you know. Okay. <laughs> but you never know when you need need an actor to just, like, read, a, um, read some dialogue with, because that's yeah. probably the hardest part, finding that partner. Yeah. So. Well, it's when I'm on the road, that's the hardest time. Like oh. if I have to be out of town for something and I'm like, uh, yeah, right. Can, yeah. <laughs> you bring, you bring all your self tape stuff with you or you find a wall with good light and yeah. no, you know, funny enough, I had, when I was in New York this week, I, I had one that I had to do and I was like, I came out to do press. Like I don't have any of my gear with me. Yeah. And they'll just accept I, it if they have to. Yeah. I get, you know, and I just, and I, I did it. I, I mean, I figured it out, but it's like, ah. <laughs> I know. Well, and that when you can't do anything about it and they're like, oh yeah. So, so much for the 48 hours you get them 24. Yeah, they want it tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, I'm using a teleprompter, you know? That's, like, I mean, that's the thing is like it, with, when you don't have the kind of time to get all the gear together to do it. And yeah. it's like, uh, you know, so, and, and that's, it is what it is. I yeah. mean, what, you know, it's like, this is the new norm. Yeah. Pivot. Pivot and with a smile and, and move on and just leave it and move on to the next. So yeah. thank you guys all so much for listening. And thank you, Amanda, so much for being thank here. Thank you, CG, my love, uh, <laughs> for being thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun, you guys. Thank you, guys. Please be sure to check my Instagram stories and posts at the Melinda Clark for what episode we're covering next? Will it be one of your favorites? Do you want to join us on the pod? If so, please go to speakpipe.com slash OCBitch and leave a voicemail or email us at beyondtheocpodcast at gmail.com and let us know why and what it, what makes it your favorite. We might play your voicemail on the show or ask you to come on live to discuss it. If you'd like to watch the podcast, check it out on the Beyond the OC YouTube channel and you can leave comments there too. If you want to be a part of the conversation, you can join our Patreon and you can get episodes early and ad-free. And you can also join live Zooms after each recording session to ask questions and chat about previous week's episodes. Or you can be one of our lovely guests in, uh, oh my God, I can't speak right now. One of our lovely guests who's <laughs> there with us and okay. asks questions and says things. Okay. Beyond the OC podcast drops every other week. Next episode is number 38 in our countdown uh, season three, episode four, The Last Waltz, with Pat, with special guest, <laughs> our beloved and hilarious casting director, Patrick Rush. See? Mistakes. Uh, We're going to use it. It's fine. Patrick. I haven't seen him in so long. Tell he is him. so funny. I love him. I love him, too. Okay, everyone, thank you, and bye, bitches. Bye, bitches. <laughs>